and welcome to The Huntington Way. My name is Pearl Sonnenshine. And I'm Lenny DiCastro. And in today's episode, we'll be talking about why teachers go into the profession in the first place and teacher burnout. So now let's dig in on why teachers go into the profession in the first place. I think for me, teachers or educators is one of the noblest professions and challenging and most rewarding profession for all. It means that why teachers go because they have love, love for learning, they love students, and they believe in the importance of education. And the other important thing is that uh, teachers can also go travel. They can work in different countries so that they can, they can be an, uh, uh, a teacher for an English, and that could be in any other part of the world as well. And lastly, teachers create a job wherein we are the be- we are the first one who are teaching the other professions like lawyers, nurses, doctors. We built the basic foundations for them to learn before they pursue their profession. And the other one as well is we would like to go make a difference in the in the child and also in the world. Definitely, yeah. And Lenny, you were an elementary school teacher for a while. What was your main reason for going into the profession? Well, the main reason for me is, of course, since I love education and I grew up in in the poor country, but with the education that I got, I can be more than that. From the Philippines, I was able to come here and I can still pursue or dig myself into education, which the way I have a tutoring center now. Right. Yeah. So easy transition into a tutoring center, still making a difference in students' lives. Yeah. And for me, I think that was one of the main reasons I became a teacher in the first place, too, is I did want to make a difference in some way. And of course, there are so many different careers that allow people to make a difference in people's lives and in the world. Um, But for me personally, teaching students was the best capacity and the best way for me to make a difference myself. Um, And especially teaching high school English the reason I chose that topic in particular is because I do think that communication skills are one of the most important life skills that someone can have after high school. No matter what field or career students go into, they're going to need to have proficient, at least, communication skills, whether it's written or oral. Um, and so I like that that subject students can really apply that to their everyday lives. I also had a few really great teachers, as most people have, um, that influenced me into going into the profession. So my middle school math teacher, actually, even though Mm -hmm. I was never good at math, she taught me that I was actually somewhat decent at math and that I learned to kind of enjoy the subject. And then in high school, I had a, a really great English teacher, and she led really interesting class discussions about the books that we were reading. Um, and yeah, it gave me more insight into the different topics that you can cover in an English class. Definitely. And then most teachers feel passionately about their classrooms and students, but many teachers end up burning out early on in their career. Mm-hmm. Roughly about 50% of new teachers leave the profession within their first five years. But if so, many teachers go into the field feeling passionate about education. So why do teachers leave? Do you have any idea, Pearl? Yeah, and I do want to clarify that no teacher goes into the profession thinking, oh, yeah, maybe I'll do this for Mm -hmm. one or two years and then switch professions altogether, right? Um, teaching does tend to be a lifelong career for many teachers. Um, But some reasons that teachers may leave the profession is lack of support from administrators, uh, burnout from taking work home outside of contract hours. And that's actually one of the reasons that I, one of the reasons why I left the formal teaching classroom is because I was grading essays. I wasn't really able to grade while in my classroom during the school day. So I brought a lot of essays home, a lot of grading home. Um, And so that was one of my reasons. And there's also a lot that goes into teaching more than what we're prepared for while earning the degree. So we're not necessarily prepared for all the stuff that happens in education outside of the classroom. A lot of teachers cite lack of autonomy in the classroom with curriculum. So a lot of teachers don't really have a choice in what they teach or how they teach it. And of course, we all know that compensation is a Mm -hmm. factor. So we don't really need to tell our audience, but I will anyway, that teachers do Um, get paid less than they should. And that really comes into play when teachers are wanting to build their own families and then they need money in order to survive and be able to um, 
yeah, live with that family. Yeah, that's right. And then since the start of the pandemic, it has only gotten worse. But just let's say the fact that during the pandemic as well, teachers who da- who, who doesn't have an idea on, all, on on to do the online from uh, in person learning, they so they transition to being an online, but they get a lot of support from the teachers and also the administration so that they can do the learning as well during the online for the online. And in a survey by the National Education Association, there are 86% respondents said that they have seen more educators leaving the classroom or retiring early since the start of the pandemic. And 80% of those who responded to the survey said that unfilled job openings have led to more work obligations for teachers still in the building. So meaning to say for those teachers who, who retire early or quit, there's a lot of burden for the other teachers who was left in the teaching profession as well. Yeah, and I do want to give a shout out to those teachers who are still uh, working in schools because those teachers are the ones that have been stepping up and helping schools still be able to function during these past two crazy years, not only with so many job openings, but also lack of substitute teacher coverage. Yes, and then we can say that teachers are the new heroes of the today's Today's, ed- today's education. Sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, especially since the onset of the pandemic, there has been a higher need of substitute teachers due to the educators being absent with illness and needing for quarantine. And locally, there has also been a large drop in the number of substitutes, from a 12% drop in D11 substitute teachers to a 50% drop in Cheyenne Mountain School District. So hopefully now that the have come down a bit with the COVID numbers, students will have a little more consistency with their teachers. But there's still a ways to go since so many teachers are leaving the profession. And of course, to wrap up and on a more positive note, despite the difficulties that teachers, students, families, administrators, and really anyone involved in education has gone through, it's important to remember that we all have a teacher we remember. Like I was talking about earlier, my middle school math teacher, my high school English teacher, and then Lenny, have there been any particular teachers that influenced you when you were younger? Well, mostly those are my elementary days because uh, they are the one who instilled the value of learning to me. And then that's the first time that I learned the basic foundation. And once you know the basic foundations of learning, it can go a long, long way. And that's where am I right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now you're able to influence many te- many students rather yes um, and also teachers at Huntington Learning Center in order to make a difference in other students lives yes definitely and um, of course it's important to remember why teachers go into the field in the first place to make a positive difference in students lives of course there are factors like burnout teacher autonomy um, needing the support of administrators but um, in general the reason that teachers go into the profession is something really positive yes and a little bit In a little bit, Pearl is going to interview Ben Honeycutt, an educator in Wilden Park School District. But first, our weekly tip for students. This week's tip is find your passion project. Yes, just like for me, my passion is education. So believe it or not, there is still life than school. You can still find ways to educate yourself outside of the school building. You can reach out to the local organizations that pertains to your interests and volunteer for different Uh, communities. Yeah, and you can also choose a project to do on your own to get more experience in what you love, whether it's woodworking, mechanics, athletics, or art. Um, Working on a passion project will only add to your resume and list of skills and help you decide what you may want to do after high school. This has been the Huntington Way. When we come back, Pearl will interview Ben Hanikat to hear more about his experience working with education's and his students in the classroom, and what this year has been like for him and his fellow educators. Welcome back to The Huntington Way. My name is Pearl Sunshine, and I am here with Ben Honeycutt, who is an educator. Um, He's a STEM teacher at Woodland Park Middle School, and he's here to talk to us about his teaching experience this year and previous years, and some of his projects outside of the classroom. So thank you, Ben, for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, So tell us a little bit about yourself. 
Uh, yeah. Uh, so my name is Ben Honeycutt. Um, I have been a teacher now for six years and teach at Woodland Park Middle School. And I have worked uh, in educational nonprofits going on my 12th year. And I, you know, I never enjoyed school when I was a student. I struggled in middle school, I struggled more in high school, and then struggled even more in college. But uh, why I was able to find success at each level was that at each level, I was fortunate enough to have teachers who just refused to give up on me. And they made their classrooms safe places for me and um, and also challenged me to really find who I was and made me want to find who I was. And so as a teacher and and all the work that I do in education, that is what I try to do for my students, is give them a place in school that is a safe place for them to be who they are and also a place where they can find out who they are too and pursue the things that they want to pursue. Yeah, and that's great that you're able to use your past experience to then influence other students. I'm sure you have a lot of grateful students because of that. Um, so obviously, this year in education on a national level has been challenging for many reasons. I've spoken to people outside of the field of education who don't quite understand the obstacle of overcoming shortages when it comes to substitute yeah. teachers. So can you put that challenge into context a little bit for those who aren't in the field of education? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think even before COVID, um, Scholastic did a, a huge study like on teachers all throughout the United States, and the average teacher worked 53 hours a week, um, just, uh, and that was before COVID. And so teachers were heavily reliant on their planning periods and heavily reliant on their time that they could use for lesson planning and for grading. And this year, just talking to teachers all throughout the country, we just haven't had a lot of that. Uh, whenever there are staffing shortages, uh, that this year, it's been very tough for so many schools to find substitute teachers, which means teachers in the building have to uh, instead use their planning periods to substitute. And this is so challenging in many ways. Uh, something like uh, uh, that a lot of students have mentioned to me is one thing that's difficult is a lot of their safe places that they have in the school, um, where they've gone to, those rooms have been closed during the times like during lunch because teachers are covering elsewhere. Um, and so it puts strain in that capacity Capacity, but it also puts strain um, if you have been a teacher who got sick and missed a couple of weeks, you can come back and your students can be way behind. You might have some classes where they had qualified or they had substitutes uh, who delivered the lesson plans, but in other classes where they weren't able to find a substitute who delivered a lesson plan. So you'll have some classes who are caught up, some that aren't. And it also means a lot of time where teachers um, are needing to trade family time to get caught up at home. And so it takes a job where there were already a lot of teachers who were uh, going above and beyond and working outside of the classroom. And um, and now they are uh, being pushed to the extreme on that. And that can make it really difficult for teachers, but also really difficult building wide, not only for teachers, but for all of the trusted adults in the building and also for students who have come to rely on teachers and their classrooms uh, through the day in order to find uh, safe places and in order to get by. Absolutely. Yeah. And I can imagine, especially for students who may not have the most um, safe or consistent home lives, yeah. that going to school is the consistency that they rely on throughout the school year. Um, and so having the same teacher or even having a substitute teacher that's able to consistently cover that content is really important. Um, and so you're a STEM teacher. You te yeah. teach technology. What strategies do you use to teach a generation that is so well connected because I've heard from a lot of people that, um, oh, well, students are on their phones all the time. So they know how to type. They know how to use yeah. the internet. When in reality, as educators, you and I both know that that's not necessarily the case. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's a great question. And I think, you know, I, I kind of compare it to driver's ed. You know, if we assume that, um, you know, there are a lot of students who are getting phones at younger and younger ages, and they've never really had a guide for how they can use those devices. So for driver's ed, you know, it'd be like if we just kind of threw students the keys and uh, to like a 65 Mustang, and we're like, hey, have fun. Um, and that's, uh, problematic for so many reasons. Like we do have the most well-connected generation of students in human history, but so many of these students only know how to be consumers with their devices. And so the challenge that I have for my students is shifting their mindset from being consumers on their devices to being creators on their devices. And a lot of them have that aspiration. I always do a survey to start uh, to uh, start my trimesters where I just survey, you know, what are students interested in with technology? What do they want to create? And so many of them want to be designers, uh, 
what or architects or uh, YouTubers. And so what we work on is what steps can you take in order to make those dreams into a practical reality. And so I, I was really influenced by a book called uh, Fab by Dr. Neil Gershenfeld, where he talked about when students have ownership over the technology that they have in the classroom, it can create laboratories of learning where teachers become facilitators uh, and students are the ones that are leading um, in the classroom. They're the ones that are taking charge. And I've really seen that play out this year with how students have used Minecrafts and uh, used Minecraft ed uh, for education and used uh, structure blocks in Minecraft to then uh, create 3D designs. Um, so to create something in Minecraft and then at, use the 3D printer to print it and hold it in their hands has been an amazing experience to sit back and watch as, uh, as a teacher. And um, the fact that students are able to use 3D designs to start creating and holding their creations in their hands um, has been amazing. But what I've loved is through every step of the way, students have stepped up to create PSA videos uh, for future students on uh, guidelines for future students on how to use the technology in their classroom. And it's really brought the ideas that I read years and years ago from Dr. Neil Gershenfeld for life in my classroom and has really been a dream come true for me in a lot of ways. Nice. Yeah. And I'm sure our audience would be very interested in checking that book out as well. Hmm. Um, so my next question is, when it comes to students in particular, we have struggling students, yeah. we have students who are doing really well in school. My first question is, what is your best piece of advice for students who are struggling? Yeah, uh, so I, yeah, I, and I remember uh, being there like when, when I was a student, never quite struggling to find my place, I think, in school. Um, and um, I, I feel honored to work uh, part of a district. We did surveying at um, the Woodland Park School District, and 89% of our students felt that they had a trusted adult in their building. And I think for students, uh, every single school building that I've worked in, um, I have worked with adults who became educators so that students could feel safe, so that students could find um, find who they are. And my advice for students would be to find those marigolds, find those people in your building that make school feel safe, that make school a place that you want to be. And um, that was how, you know, I was able to find success in school. But it also, you know, we're in school 160, 170 days a year. Um, so what can you do during those days so that school is a place that uh, you want to be? And so that's usually uh, usually the approach that I have had when I've had conversations with students in that way. Um, and I think, um, I, cause I know there are teachers in every building who want a hundred percent of their students to feel safe, uh, when they enter their classroom. Yes, definitely. As a former teacher, I can yeah. verify that statement. Um, what about students who are actually doing well in school? Because I'm not sure we talk so much about that. We often focus on the students who are struggling. So what about students who are getting A's and B's and seem to have a good social life, seem to have good relationships with their teachers. What advice would you give to them? Uh, to lean into the challenges. Um, that's one thing with students that um, who are accustomed to getting straight A's. Uh, a tough conversation I can have with those students sometimes is uh, to find the challenges, to actually find that pushback at this age when you are in middle school or you are in high school, because there will be a time in your life where you do encounter failure. And if you look at a lot of the most successful people in history, they don't talk about the way that they had instant success every single place they went to. They talk about how their failures defined them because that allowed them to figure out how to overcome those challenges. And so that's something I love to do with my uh, students who are having a lot of success. It's like, okay, how can we take your passion and start applying it to the real world? Um, a couple of my students uh, this year, uh, one thing I love with technology is I don't want it to be an end all. I, I want students to take their traditional passions and figure out how they can amplify those passions with technology. So I had a student who was drawing on a sketch pad and doing time lapses and uh, she talked about how it would be really cool if she could paint one of the walls of the school and she kind of said it in like well that'd be cool and I was like well why not um, and so she ended up making a proposal to the principal and ended up painting an entire mural in front of the school and is now talking to um, the Woodland Park community about maybe uh, painting the tunnels um, that are underneath uh, underneath the town. Um, and we have a group of students who are now wanting to lead the charge on that. And what's amazing is that now that they're talking to people in the real world, they might, they'll make meetings with some people and those people won't make their meetings. And the students will come to me being like, 
well, what do we do now? What, you know, and it's almost like they're asking me where the rubric is. And I'm like, I don't know. What do you do? And seeing them encounter those challenges, though, um, I feel like that's one of the best things that I can do as a teacher, because eventually you are going to hit those challenges in life and figuring out how you respond to those challenges, I think is one of the best things or best problems I can pose to students. Yeah. And in real life after school, you don't get grades. And yeah. so it's good to be prepared for those challenges and know really how to succeed in the quote unquote real world um, if there aren't any grades. So in addition to being a teacher, you're also involved in education efforts outside of the classroom. Can you tell our audience a little bit about the other projects you're leading? Yeah, absolutely. So I uh, wrote a young adult book uh, centered on bullying called Bleak, uh, which is aimed at a high school audience. And I also co-founded a nonprofit called Open World Cause. And with... uh, that nonprofit, what we do is we are partnered with schools uh, in Nepal and in Kenya. And the goal of the nonprofit is to try to bring um, educational opportunities uh, to students around the world. That's kind of our mission statement. And um, I started the nonprofit, uh, co-founded the nonprofit when I was in high school. And um, and it started as just an effort to bring two laptops and internet access uh, to a school in Nepal. And I was challenged by a teacher to create a legacy. Um, that was what hooked me. I was never really, I, I, I never really saw a lot of motivation with grades, something that I think both my parents can attest to. Um, but it was wanting to create a legacy. Uh, that was the challenge that hooked me. And that original effort to get two laptops and internet access uh, expanded in college to become a nonprofit that helped fund the construction of a school in Nepal and now uh, and then eventually a school in Kenya. Um, We partnered with Days for Girls uh, to uh, Um, so that uh, women in Nepal could lead uh, women's health uh, classes uh, in Nepal as well and have worked to provide clean water to the communities that we work with as well. And um, and that all started as just a challenge I had from a teacher in high school. And so what we do now as a nonprofit is we extend that challenge uh, to schools all across the United States. Uh, We've had multiple students uh, in the United States where their initiatives have led to scholarships opportunities. Um, And what we also try to do is follow the fair trade learning process practices. A a close friend of mine um, named Dr. Eric Hartman uh, set those, uh, uh, helped establish those fair trade learning practices so that the work that students in the United States do with students around the world can, one, be relevant to what students around the world need and also lead to long-term impacts. And right now, our nonprofit is actually working closely with a student in Nepal named Swachalika, trying to see what we can do to help bring uh, college opportunities uh, for uh, her in the United States. And so um, being able to work at that nonprofit to help build those bi-directional partnerships between students uh, in Nepal and students in the United States, giving them entrepreneurial opportunities that can help define not only who they are as students, but help define what they want to do in life um, has been something that has been life-defining for me. Yeah, I can imagine. And you've, haven't you been to Nepal and Kenya? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Through the nonprofit work uh, in college, we did a student-initiated travel abroad um, at the University of Kansas, um, and we're able to travel to Nepal just to do surveying to figure out what the community most needed uh, from us. Um, And we were able to do a trip like that to Kenya, and we've done three trips Um, And after each trip, something we're very proud of is that um, those uh, trips have directly led to us um, being able to fundraise and um, and donate money to the local builders in the community to build schools that continue to serve those communities that we've traveled to. Mm. What an an amazing experience for you to be able to go and actually see your efforts at play. Nice. Um, So anything that you'd like to leave our audience with about teachers and education today? Yeah, so something I've talked about, I've talked about the teachers who, like, refuse to give up on me, the teachers um, who um, have uh, inspired me as a student and continue to inspire me as a teacher. Um, I The teachers in my building, I, I work with uh, Mrs. Strotland, Mr. Spaulding, you know, um, I uh, have... Uh, shown me what I can do to build curriculum that directly impacts students. But the teachers that I often think about, the teachers who inspired me um, growing up, um, this year's been a hard year for us all, like such a hard year. And the thing I started worrying about is what about those teachers who inspire students every day? What if they leave the classroom? 
And uh, because my educational experience, I would not be the person I am today if I didn't have teachers who challenged me to make a difference. And so I think about them all the time. And so I've reached out to them. I've encouraged my friends to reach out to the teachers that meant a lot to them, uh, that meant a lot to them, because every single person I've ever talked to in parent teacher conferences or just my friends can always name those teachers who made a difference in their lives. And something that I think <laughs> means so much to those teachers is when they hear from their students about the impacts that they had, especially this year. Because the message I have for all teachers, I can't blame any teacher who has needed to step away after the challenges the last two years have posed. But the message I want to give to teachers today is that y you are making a difference. What you do matters. Thank you for all you do, and thank you for still being there in spite of all the challenges, because what you are doing for students is making a difference, and it couldn't be more important in this time. Thank you so much for that message. I'm sure a lot of people out there would love to hear that. And and yeah, hopefully listeners will take this chance to reach out to the teachers that really influenced them when they were in school. So thank you so much for being here on the podcast. Where can people find you? What's your website? Yeah, uh, binhoneycut.com. And uh, if you find me, Ben Honeycut on social media, I'm always up to have conversations and uh, always up to build educational partnerships as well. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. This has been The Huntington Way. My name is Pearl Sun and Shine, and we'll see you next time.